He always said that his gaining a lot of weight was intentional, and that I was supposed to be disgusted by him. Girl, what? Why didn't I think of that excuse when I put on a little extra weight after my wedding? I'm Jim Fritch. I need all you dozens of viewers out there to just tell me how you like this, all right? Hey kids, have you ever thought that someone was one way only to find out that they aren't who you thought they were? Like that time I found out the weird Arby's guy was actually a comedian and that I had been had. Crash into me! Crash into me! I don't know. Well, if you're into that kind of thing, then you are going to love this bad vegan documentary on Netflix. This documentary swindles you, okay? It swindles you into thinking that it's a four-part series about a vegan who ate Domino's. Domino's. Domino's pizza. 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 Domino's. Pizza. Chicken wings. Chicken wings. Pizza. 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 Pizza box. Domino's. Pizza. Eating pizza. Domino's pizza. Who cares about their pizza? But oh no, it's much more than that. But the couple that supposedly preached a healthy vegan lifestyle ordered a pizza. Yeah, honestly, don't even watch the trailer because the whole pizza thing is the least of our worries. Pizza. Netflix is bad vegan, let's get into it. Okay, so I wanna talk about this because A, the story is wild. Like the craziest thing I've heard since abducted in plain sight. And B, Netflix was just so weird with how they set up this documentary. There's so many gaps in the story. The whole thing just ends up looking more like a big old moldy piece of Swiss cheese. And just a fair warning, there's gonna be lots of spoilers. This is basically like, I watched it so you don't have to type of video. The whole thing centers around this woman, Sarma Melangelis, who was an investment banker turned like restaurateur. She owned and operated this raw vegan restaurant in New York City called Pure Food and Wine. This was like a hot spot in New York City. Celebrities would frequent the place. Owen Wilson used to just post up in the back and like walk through the kitchen. That's so weird to me. Owen Wilson just walked through the kitchen barefoot like he owned the place. Like, wow. What a neat establishment. President Clinton, I guess, liked to go there, who I'm not gonna impersonate because I don't make fun of presidents anymore. Gwyneth Paltrow, Tom Brady, all of these celebrities loved the place. It was a hot spot. Sarma was killing it as a vegan boss babe. But it all sort of came crashing down when this weird guy from Massachusetts, Anthony Strange, just shows up, ruins her life, takes all her money, eats all her kale, convinces her he can make her dog live forever amongst a bunch of other lies. They end up on the run and ultimately he gets both him and her caught by ordering pizza and chicken wings. Chicken wings. Way to go, dude. You couldn't resist the allure of dominoes? <laughs> I mean, same here, but. So that's kind of the Cliff's Notes version, but you may be asking yourself, what caused this mess? At whom can we point the finger of blame? What stands at the center? And to that I say, Alec Baldwin stands at the center. I'm just kidding, it's not really his fault, but he was kind of the involuntary catalyst that kicked off this whole debacle. The way this documentary presents this, <laughs> is that Alec Baldwin was a regular at the Strant at Pure Food and Wine. He developed a sort of relationship with Sarma, kind of had a crush on her. They showed that he was tweeting about her and stuff. Talking to her about wanting to have somebody in his life, she would, instead of offering herself, suggest that maybe he should adopt a dog. Wait, what? You know, I was sending him emails of links to dogs. So because Alec was telling her he wanted someone special in his life, she decided to email him dogs. And in the process of emailing dogs, to Alec, she found a dog herself, Leon. Is that right? That's a weird setup, but Leon the dog is very important in this story, so pay attention. So then Sarma starts observing Alec Baldwin tweeting this other guy, Shane Fox, who turns out to actually be Anthony Strangis, or Strangis, I don't know. He was basically using a fake name and like catfishing everybody. Him and Alec Baldwin's tweets together were so odd. They were very friendly. Shane slash Anthony, or Shanthony, would tweet things like, I need a new suit, any advice from my life coach? And he got responses from Alec Baldwin one as if they were friends. Or this one was super weird. They kind of just gloss over it in the documentary, but it says, Chaney and Martha Stewart got a cookbook coming out. What's it called? Alec Baldwin responds, yellow cake uranium treats. Kind of a weird politically charged conversation to be having on Twitter. <laughs> what do I know? I just work here. Shanthony was like tweeting Alec stick figure drawings. I don't know, it was really weird, but all of this was just irresistible to Sarma. And something about that was like, was appealing. 
And that was kind of how her relationship first started with Shane slash Anthony or Shanthony. Shanthony. Anthony. I like Shanthony. But what they never explain and we never hear the backstory on is how and why Shanthony and Alec Baldwin were tweeting each other in the first place. I tried to see more, but Alec Baldwin's tweets are all protected. I get it. We tried to look into it because to me it's like kind of a interesting part of the story that they left out. The answer was so weird. All we could find was this weird information about how first Alec made a Twitter account for his wife and Shanthony was her first follower. And that's how they became friends or something. That makes it even more confusing to me because I'm picturing Shanthony just sitting there like watching Alec's every move on Twitter, waiting with bated breath before he made his wife a Twitter account. I don't know, I digress. The point is this sort of internet interaction between Alec Baldwin and Shanthony is what made Sarma feel comfortable with this guy and they end up chatting and developing like an online relationship. So she starts telling all her friends that she is in love with this guy. I remember her telling me that she had met a guy on Words with Friends. I thought they met on Twitter, but according to Mark, other, they met each other on another app. So finally, Shanthony comes to New York. He and Sarma meet for the first time. He is not quite what she expected. He was a bit heavier. This documentary, <laughs> they focus so much on this guy's size throughout this whole documentary. It was extremely weird to me. Yeah, there's extra weight there. 300 pounds. He was a big guy. Unhealthy. Gaining a lot of weight. He stuck his fat head Anthony out. Anthony was gaining weight. He was mammoth. Overweight fellow who subsisted on tuna fish sandwiches with extra mayonnaise from Subway. Fat bastard. So Shane slash Anthony starts hanging around the strong. Nobody really seems to understand exactly who he is, what he does for a living, why he had 50,000 Instagram followers. I still want to talk about that. Like I'm assuming he probably bought the followers like through a bot, but I'm very curious. I don't know why. But anyway, the story he gave Sarma was that he was involved in some sort of like military black ops stuff. He was involved in some sort of like black ops, like the stuff that's under the radar. He was always hiding what he was doing on his computer. He would disappear for days at a time. Sarma said that there was a time she like walked out of the bathroom and kind of checked over his shoulder and it looked like he was surveying like drone footage. I don't know, the guy was shrouded in mystery. I think somehow because Leon really liked him, I thought, okay, well he must be okay. Yeah, I don't know. Dogs are good judges of character, so I can't really blame her for putting so much trust into Leon. This guy appeared like he had a lot of money. He wore a Rolex, drove a Bentley, had an assistant, had a driver. He was very convincing. There was something he said when I do what I do so people like you can sleep at night. Like eat pizza, chicken wings. Chicken wings. So pretty shortly into the story, everybody kind of finds out that he's not who he says he was. He's saying his name is Shane, but then there was like a caller ID snafu where he called the restaurant and the caller ID said Anthony Strangis and the employees ended up Googling the name and found out that he is a straight up criminal. So we learned that Shane Fox was not Shane Fox and he was Anthony Strangis. Shanthony. <laughs> Netflix kind of, again, glossed over this. They said he had some arrest record, but I wanted to know more. This little screenshot they showed intrigued me. It just says that he was impersonating an officer. And it turns out that this was actually a domestic dispute between he and his, spoiler alert, previous wife. Yeah. There was an off-duty cop that overheard the disturbance and walked over and told Anthony to like back off and leave. And Anthony flashed a badge. Where he got a badge, I don't know, but he basically just held up a badge and was like, no, no, we're good, man. I I'm one of you. This is where I'm gonna be holding a police badge. So he gets apprehended. Turns out there was an arrest warrant for a previous crime he committed in Sarasota, Florida. Sarasota? Sarasota, Florida. But those documents are sealed like Mary-Kate and Ashley's lips. Many of you are probably thinking like, this is insane. Why would she, especially at this point, believe anything this man said? But something I thought was so interesting is that his dad was corroborating all of his lies this whole time. I met his father who backed up everything that he said about himself. So then they get married. <laughs> Boom, 24 hours, we did it and got married. Weird, right? So if you thought this was all weird, here's where it starts to really get out of this world. First of all, Shanthony persuades Sarma to give all of her bank account details to this trusted advisor guy, Will Richards. Remember Will, more about him later. In addition to that, Shanthony has also started to convince her that he is not of this world. He's superhuman, an extraterrestrial, if you will. He would often imply that he wasn't human and that Sarma was just a mere mortal. He referred to her, he came up with this nickname for her called like tiny blonde human. It was all very gradual 
unusual how he did it. And so just slowly but surely over time, she started to believe this ethereal story he told. So as part of this lie, Anthony ends up convincing Sarma that her dog could be immortal. Anthony promises her that he is going to make both Sarma and her dog immortal, just like Anthony is. He literally brainwashed her into thinking that they were going to live in some sort of utopian dog immortality paradise that he would often refer to as the happily ever after. It's like some fantastical, magical future where my dog is gonna live forever. But also at the same time that he's convincing her of all this stuff, he starts asking her for money. So he had me wire money to him to prove that I was committed to him. I just picture him being like my power, my wealth, my influence, all yours. By the way, can I borrow six bucks? Saying like, look, you're gonna get way more from me than I'm taking from you right now. Don't worry, whenever we move into our dog utopian paradise, everything will be square. Kinda sounds like a televangelist. Start giving and just see what happens in your life. That world of vegans is also a world full of people who believe in new age mysticism, palm reading, crystals. Yeah, so according to this guy, uh, veganism is just weird and vegans just believe weird stuff. Got it. I actually really like that curly haired guy. So Anthony kind of starts bumming around the strong, you know, acting like he owned the place, making weird comments about the future of pure food and wine as if he had big plans for it. And all the employees are just like, do you, do you have experience in owning a restaurant? Is that like part of your black ops training or, or no? Whatever his background was, it didn't have to do with restaurants. So all this while he's asking, he's still asking Sarma for more money, more money, more money. And if she objects, he belittles and berates her saying super manipulative stuff like, you're back to valuing money over me and are happily ever after. <sighs> Raise your hand if you know someone like that. I just can't wait for you guys to see what he's doing with the money. Spoiler alert, it's not being used for business ventures or magical dog utopias. So one day Shane goes MIA, he would do that a lot. He would just disappear for several days and she assumed it was military black ops stuff. And so she is corresponding with Will, Remember Will, who they describe in this documentary as some sort of computer techie expert who works in the government. Some sort of computer techie expert that works in the government. So they actually bring Will in, Netflix does I mean, and they interview him throughout the rest of this documentary and he really seems to corroborate Shanthony's whole story. Shane and I were working together for years. So Will is basically like a government go-between between Sarma and Shanthony and he was there to keep her safe by encrypting her emails and he would sort of give her these vague reassurances when Shanthony would ghost her. Okay so this took another super weird turn when she Anthony starts acting like he is, uh, what's the word, clairvoyant or something. He seemed to know where she was all the time. She gave an example of she met a friend for lunch, never once told Shanthony where she was going, and the waitress came up to her and was like, you have a phone call and it was him. This was all part of his whole weird scheme, this whole plan to convince her that her reality was not real and that his reality was. So then he mentions the family like that movie, The Family. <laughs> the Family was supposed to be this overarching group of judges who can decide whether or not you can be a superhuman alien like them. Shanthony took this really far. He even went so far as to tell her there was a house in California where the family lives, but you can't get in unless you're a superhero alien like us. Do you know if you needed to change physical form to enter the house? Oh, yeah. There's literal emails from him telling her that she will transform into a queen of the family. She'll get paid like $100,000 a month for life. There was a lot of threats. There was a lot of like, do what I say or everyone you love will be destroyed. He threw in this other part of the story about this brother he had that could see and hear everything. His brother could see anywhere and everywhere. The old omnipotent brother trick. Oldest trick in the book. You know about the meat suit? Lady Gaga's meat suit? Or is there another meat suit? What is the meat suit? Yeah, what, what's the meat suit? My interpretation of what the meat suit is was that Anthony was gaining weight. Oh, well that's disappointing. Here I was thinking we were gonna get to see him in some Lady Gaga-esque suit made of draping meat, but it was just that he was getting a little husky. Thanks, Netflix. 
for getting my hopes up. This is worth mentioning though, because it was yet another part of his weird lie. He claimed that his weight gain was another like cosmic endurance test for Sarma. Gaining a lot of weight was intentional and that I was supposed to be disgusted by him. Girl, what? Why didn't I think of that excuse when I put on a little extra weight after my wedding? Okay, so then we meet this guy, Nazim. Nazim tended bar at a bar that Shantani uh, frequented. And by frequented, I mean- He was coming like twice a day, four, five times a week. Because you know, black ops stuff, I guess. So Shantani kind of lures Nazim into his circle. He tells him that there's this big business opportunity with pure food and wine, swindles the guy out of $35,000 and they take selfies together. <gasps> hey guys, what's up? I know a lot of you are asking about my scamming routine. Uh, let me know if you want a full tutorial. So Nazim is the real, Oh gee, he's the golden child of this story because it is him who first starts to catch on to Shantani's schemes and he convinces Sarma to start recording their phone conversations, without which we might not have this really weird documentary. If asked tomorrow to send a wire, are you gonna do it? So episode three is where you find out that Shantani actually had a wife and a kid back in Florida, but you already knew that because I spoiled it for you. So they interview his ex-wife and her story is very similar to Sarma's. She basically says Anthony also told her a bunch of lies, which his dad corroborated. His father did confirm that Anthony was a Navy SEAL. I would like to talk to his dad by the way. He told her this wild story about how his aunt died and left him $5 million, went so far as to set up bank accounts for them to spend a bunch of money, but then the check never came and he like wouldn't get a job. Anthony would not get a job. He convinced her that he had creatures chasing him. He called them they. He called them they. Like as in they from the movie They. The amount of lies this guy told that were actually just pieces of plots from movies he really liked is wild. Like the whole omnipotent brother thing. That was from Thor. What? So Shantani one day decides to send Sarma to Rome by herself. He doesn't tell her why. He just assures her that if she can get through this, the family will let her into their magical club. He basically told me that like, the family that like they think that you can't get through this get through what what is it but of course it turns out that the rome thing was just his way of getting sarma out of the way so that he could take over her strong so the employees start texting sarma like um hey are you gonna are you gonna come back to the restaurant that you own and she's like no nah, i'm busy selfie rome selfie when in rome <laughs> He's still continuing to take her money. She is still corresponding with Will via email. And at this point, he has drained so much money from her that she can't even make payroll to pay her employees. So she ends up having to get a loan from a friend for $100,000 just to make payroll. And Netflix, again, kind of glosses over that. And I want to know who that friend is because I would like to um, maybe also be friends with that person. And all the while she's still being further convinced of this outlandish tale that it's all gonna pay off and it's all a test and soon she will have her happily ever after and be a queen princess superhero. We are at a crossroads now. I will present you with two options. Stay in the dark a little longer. Continue to trust me no matter how it may seem or look or not. And we go to Monaco on Saturday together and finish this. Finish what? What is this? I guess she chose option two because they end up in Paris. In my notes, I wrote, so then they go to Paris? What is this story? Why is she taking weird selfies? There's a lot of selfies in this documentary. So the truth comes out for Sarma here in Paris. While they're there, he starts hitting up the casinos. We went from place to place in Europe and so a lot of those cities we went to had casinos in them. Now technically, if you've watched this documentary, you will know that Nazim already touched on that a little, but this was when Sarma like officially found out and saw firsthand what he was doing with all of her money. This is it, guys. Of all the lies you could conjure up to hide a gambling problem. Six months he spent in the Foxwoods casino. I don't get it. Like why, if he had just stuck with the black ops thing, that was working for him. He could have said that was where the money was going. He could have easily told her that it was being invested and that they were waiting on a return. I just, I don't like lies, but I can think of so many better lies than you're gonna be the queen of a superhuman alien family and your dog will live forever. You know what I'm saying? What is happening? Now, guys, I wanna be clear. I'm not making fun of Sarma for believing this lie, okay? I know firsthand how manipulative people can be. I'm just so flabbergasted at his manner of manipulating. So while all this is happening, Sarma is continuing to get emails and texts and calls from her unpaid employees who are running the restaurant without her. And she's either ignoring them or like making weird, vague excuses as to what's happening and when they'll get their paychecks. And again, she's posting selfies on Instagram 
Instagram traveling around Europe while her restaurant is getting shut down. So all of her employees end up walking out. The restaurant has to close down. Sarma ends up having to schmooze these new investors to reopen the restaurant. I think it said she raised over like $800,000 in record time to reopen her restaurant. Will is still around by the way. Oh wait, nope, no he's not. There was no Will. It was just another email account that he made. Gotcha. Will was just Shanthony the whole time. How could you do that to us, Netflix? How could you bamboozle us like the Bowser vids guy? <laughs> so Will is not real, and all that time that she thought Shanthony was clairvoyant, turns out he was just reading her emails. <laughs> the story continues to get so much more convoluted, I can't possibly include every detail because this video would be an hour long. But long story long, the restaurant closes down again for a second time. One day I was walking past the restaurant and I see this crowd of people. <laughs> Can you believe, can you believe this? I can't. It closes down for a second time because she's not there running it or paying her employees. So now all of that money she raised that she owes back to these investors to open the restaurant a second time has disappeared into the casino and chicken wings. Chicken wings. Sarma and Shanthony end up on the run, first in Connecticut, just like random states, living out of hotels. Anthony isn't even hiding the gambling thing anymore at this point. And look, I'm not here to knock anybody with a gambling problem, okay? I too had a gambling problem when I was 12. Gambling! But seriously, it's a serious problem, I know. I just don't think it's a problem that requires you to convince a woman who trusts you that you're a magical alien who can make her dog immortal. You know what I mean? Everything comes to a wild end when and after about 10 months or so of being on the run, they end up in Tennessee. And the documentary really focuses on these last couple weeks in Tennessee. They talked a lot about how Sarma couldn't find the healthy food she wanted, so she would go to Chipotle a lot. <laughs> Frustrating how hard it was to find any healthy food. There was a Chipotle across the street. I was going there regularly. She made a friend at Chipotle named Dustin. We get a six pack and hang out. Meanwhile, Shanthony is just eating junk food and playing Call of Duty. You're sitting in your room playing Call of Duty, making me go buy you disgusting food. Tuna fish sandwiches with extra mayonnaise from Subway. And then finally, a warrant is issued for their arrest for ripping off the investors. It only took 600 years and a full blown employee strike for anybody to notice that anything was happening. So Sarma has faced a lot of criticism for all of this because of the fact that she, at this point, seemed to be fully aware of what he was doing, even went so far as to change her name. She was telling everyone in Tennessee that her name was Emma, all the while still claiming that she didn't know that they were fugitives. I never had the sense that we were sort of fugitives. People are kind of like, well, what did you think was happening? What did you think was happening to the restaurant? Who did you think was paying your employees? You know what I mean? I felt like she was stealing from us. She's too smart not to know what was going on. Well, other people feel like she was a victim and she was brainwashed by this extremely abusive, manipulative person and she was under his thumb through all of it. I don't like making judgment calls or anything. I just, I think the phone conversations are pretty telling. You know, you can hear in her voice that she has reservations, but she felt like she had to go along with it. I've been in similar situations, not like with immortal dogs or anything, but you know. So here it is guys, the pizza and chicken wings that ended it all. So Anthony's credit card gets pinged when he orders Domino's. It alerted the authorities in Tennessee and they sprung into action. They were hot on the pizza trail. <laughs> that was the pizza that led us from Domino's to the hotel. They focused so much on how messy his room was with chicken wings. Pizza boxes, chicken wings. They finally get arrested. Her friend Dustin from Chipotle had to take care of Leon. I said, what about the dog? Well, the dog's with some people. No, 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 no. Dog ain't staying with no rednecks. I'm taking the dog. Mm -hmm. Shanthony. I thought the employees' reactions, like the restaurant employees' reactions that they showed was pretty interesting. He looks like the Hamburglar. <gasps> they didn't really seem to view Sarma as this victim slash battered woman, but instead they were kind of making fun of the whole thing. They just couldn't believe that she ate pizza. I cannot imagine Sarma eating pizza. There was no indications that she consumed that pizza. <laughs> Why is that important? So when all is said and done, guys, the collateral damage was $6 million. Anthony Strangis was sentenced to one year behind bars and five years probation. Sarma was sentenced also to five years probation and a split six month jail sentence of which she served four months at Rikers Island. So Shanthony is out and about, you guys, living his best. Although I'm sure this Netflix documentary affected his life a little bit, but really he can do whatever he wants. He can even order Domino's if he wants. 
sorry, Shanthony, I feel like you're going to watch this and I just, I'm not judging you, okay? I just make fun. So here's another fun fact that Netflix didn't tell you, which I think is very interesting. Sarma was actually paid a pretty penny. It's an undisclosed amount that Netflix paid her to create this documentary. But the kicker is she plans to use that money to pay back all of her employees from the restaurant, which I think is so good. You can't deny that. Good is good. The rabbit hole on this goes so far. I was seeing so many crazy conspiracy theories, stuff about her and her lawyer. Like the media took this really far. It's one of the more fast fascinating stories I've heard and I want to hear your opinions and I had to talk about it. So that's it for me today, kids. Thanks for watching and just remember, not every secret agent, superhero alien, black ops government, Navy SEAL millionaire that you meet is who they say they are. They could just be a chicken wing eating, meat suit wearing, gambling man. <laughs> Let me know your thoughts. See you guys next time. He appeared like he had a lot of money. He wore a Rolex, he drived a bent, he drived. <laughs> There was chicken wings everywhere, and pizza, and chips, tons of Little Debbie snack cakes. <laughs> he would say, well, I can't talk to you about that now. I'll have to wait till we're in the box. I'm sorry, what's good? Are we not going to talk more about the box? What is the, what's in the box? Toilet cleaner? Yeah. I thought it was a poker job. A poker I job? I thought I was there to gamble. No, you're there to- Gambling. No, you're there to clean toilet. Gambling. As you can see, I keep my cars everywhere I go. They're just a part of me. I want to gamble!